Welcome to News from Underground. Hopefully everybody out there has had, had a good, uh, well, plan for the snowpocalypse or, you know, hibernated the past, past couple of days. We've had a lot of snow here, in particular Richmond. Uh, we went out there ourselves a few days ago just trying to go in there for like the entire city. It was in a, you know, one of those snow globes that's shaking all around. You can even see this kind of... Uh, so the first announcement we're going to go into is uh, in February, our next Freedom Gathering is going to take place at the Maplewood Anarchy Garden, presented by no other than Isaac Markison. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to be giving a little lecture about how we can use common herbs that you find around the state, um, other things that you might only be able to find in stores or online, but ways that we can use plants to influence our cognition, um, our immune system, um, pretty much most elements that are going on with you, there are a lot of things that you can do to either prevent or treat whatever is going on with you um, without necessarily having to rely on pharmaceutical means, um, health insurance. You, we can avoid a lot of the stuff taking back our own health care using means all around us while herbs are everywhere. All right, all right. Yeah. So that'd be, that'd be a fun talk. So that'll be, uh, I think that talk starts at 8.30, Pollock starts at 7.30, and then, uh, yeah, we have a whole list of fun talks stuff for this year. We have a new co-host. Uh, well, coming back to the show, a lot of like Johnny Howie uh, and Arizona and a lot of people. So back to the segment of this year's uh, News from Underground. I'd like to say anything like uh, you're interested in or wow the crowd a little bit. Oh. So there's this new Facebook group, and it's called the Black Flag Coalition, and it's actually, the idea is to unite anarchists from different backgrounds, you know, um, basically anarchists without adjectives, uh, and try to get us to work together to achieve a mutual goal. So that's exciting. Uh, I don't find that exciting. Uh, I don't think you can really... Uh, really work with uh, people who won't respect your self-ownership or your private property. Uh, and if they did, then they would be ANCAPs. They would be uh, ANCAMIs or anarcho <coughs> syndicalists. Um, and that's so much that if we were to say that, hey, uh, let's form a coalition of some sort and people are, and call them anarchists, but then when people see them advocating for minimum wage and going to minimum wage rallies here, like local income stuff done, They'll sort of say, well, this anarchy is also for Bernie Sanders, anarchy is also for minimum wage laws, and I don't uh, never really find that to be... Uh, well, these are all anarchists who have been in the movement for a while, so <clears throat> it's not new people who are joining, really. From what I've seen on the page, um, by print, on the principle, I agree with you, I understand where, where you're coming from, but from what I've seen on the page, people agree that eventually communities would form, and that they're whatever they're doing is going to be inside the community, and if you were to intrude in someone else's community, you would become a tyrant by any anarchist definition. So everyone here is agreeing to uh, the NAP. Yeah. You just have to abide by the rules, whichever community, right. if you're going to enter it, they have the rules outlined and you respect those. Right, which, uh, you know, that, that's how it would work, right, in terms of a lot of, like the Amish community, a lot of different kinds of communities, I just find contention in that uh, the right is, is that you know, uh, they don't respect uh, the fence, for example, of my front yard because I'm not home for that one day and someone will come in like a mutualist and just kind of just take it over. Well, no one's kind of using these resources to their maximum utility. So that's if you don't that respect the boundaries of the community. Yeah, right. These people sort of saying that they yeah. would respect boundaries of communities. Well, now, if you went really to a mutualist community and you built a house there, I don't know why you would. <laughs> it seems kind of silly. But, and you put up a fence um, and you left your house for vacation or something, and it was common practice. I mean, I'm not that familiar with mutualism, so I could be wrong here, but from what I understand is if something somebody's not using something, you can use it. I hope I'm not wrong. Um, but anyway, so yeah, if you built a house there and you weren't using it and the rules were, hey, if you're not using something, somebody else can, you know, then yeah, that's your own fault. Right, <laughs> you're right. the one who built a house in that community. But I, so. I would say that these, these ideas that they have, and those communities they work, but they don't advocate ideas in which outside of those communities that they have to respect the boundaries of my private property. Is because as soon as that they do that, then you're an ANCAP, and my measure standard. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's ideas in which they, they believe there's limited forms. Either for me, there's no limited. You either respect private property or you don't. 
And most of these other uh, the adjective groups don't believe that. And so that's where I have problems with that. That's because I'm going to create my, we're going to create our own community and they're going to want to say, well, you know what, you don't own the land, so I'm just going to come and trespass. I'm just going to come uh, and go ahead and do, you know, take that house. Uh, so at some point they have to respect private property. They want to respect the boundaries of our community. And if they do that, then I'd say they become, they become ANCAPs and mm -hmm. practice uh, the kinds of basically, stuff they want to do. There. Basically what we're working on right now is not really going too much into those details. Just understanding that we're not violent people, number one, and number two, we all want to end the state. So, as long as we can come to that agreement, which we have, we've met on common ground, then together, it's better for us to work together to achieve that. And then from there, then we can go our separate ways, create our own communities, do whatever we want. But when you have like 15 different types of anarchists, you know, all trying to end the state in their different ways, like, it's, it's just not efficient. You know, we're all doing it at different times, we're doing it different ways. If we all come together, and we can just say, hey, you know what? We do differ on certain points, but we all agree that we want to end the state, right? Okay, so baby steps, let's do that first, and then we can work out any other details that we want to. Um, and I understand why we fall. I mean, this is... You know, stay the slap at anar anarchists, the ones who actually understand that there are different kinds of anarchists, like, it's hilarious to them because we're actually all fighting each other. No, no nobody really knows that sort of stuff. Like, Some states do. Libertarians. Out, out there, out there uh, yeah, here in Richmond, the only kind of anarchist people knew about were anarcho communists for a long time, for, for, for like over a decade. And the same has been going for many cities across the country. And Cons have had over a year, 100 years, to do something with the word anarchy. And there are so no measure of success except for getting merit badges of arrests and uh, cannibalizing each other with uh, checker privilege types of nonsense. Well, maybe because they didn't have other anarchists to work with. Well, well that, that's just, that's just the, the social group there. And so now here in Richmond, anarchy is being associated now with anarcho capitalism, with a lot of our uh, the businesses here who we've partnered with. Now they see anarchists as people who are respecting their storefront windows, who are respecting private property. Uh, and the wealth that they create in their self ownership. Uh, let the I say they let the incomes fail. They've already failed. Let's upmarket them uh, and succeed where we've already succeeded here in Richmond and knocking them out and continue continuing to drive and bring anarchy where we're supposed to go where all the other ones with adjectives have failed. Or we can work together in the state. There's no one left to work here in Richmond. Maybe not in Richmond, but no, the coalition is all across. Actually, we have some people from Canada too. We want, obviously, we want anarchy worldwide. That's the ultimate goal. You know, right now we're going to start in the U.S., preferably close to D.C., and then work our way out. But, I mean, okay, we work together, we win the state. Now, if what you believe is true, which probably is, honestly, but, so if after we win the state, they build their own community and it fails, then maybe they'll become ANCAPs. But, we can work together in the time being and just respect each other's different ideologies. Um, maybe they will succeed, maybe they won't. If the state know, falls and there are anarcho communists, do they still get their own community? Mm -hmm. Go ahead and market your own. I'm not going to advocate or support you in that nonsense. No more than I'm going to tell someone, leave them the wrong way, where they're going to get hurt and injured. I don't think you have to lose your identity in joining other people to defeat the common enemy. They support the enemy, they support the police state. They support them in ways in which they want the minimum ways to force them to business owners. But we, we don't have to meld our identities yeah. together like if there ever were uh, an effort where we could work together. I'm not saying I have an right, idea right. of how we can even work together or right. why that's necessary really, but if there were a time, why? Yeah, I would hope that I'll be open to that discussion. Of course. Yeah. I'll be open to that discussion and then to uh, look and examine areas in which uh, have a sober conversation about areas of activism they've done that have never shown a measure of success. Uh, you try to bring down the state using the state and it's never worked and only gets yourself and your friends arrested and time in which uh, parents uh, can't be that far apart from their children when they're in a cage. Uh, and that happens to ha happen to a lot of my friends already here in Richmond. So, uh, and in DC. So it's not a yeah, there's a lot of area to talk and to try to see if we can come to a consensus, but I'll let that happen when it happens in the future. I think for the most part we're doing a great thing here, showing a great measure of success near and near four years, um, and just knocking out all the, uh, the other groups out there. Uh, they want to talk, they want to work together, 
I'm always open for that. Um, but as long know, as it's not violent. Yeah, but but we're gonna have to talk because the thing is, uh, when you're advocating for minimum wage, it's like you're you're, you're advocating for the police state, and that's something I can't. So you're saying we should help them with their rhetoric. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to say that, yes. Why not? You can't. Well, let's well, get them behind the NAP. Okay. To its fullest extent, then they're no longer a problem. They have their community. Right. And inevitably, I think it'll be a more beautiful world if we had different communities with people with completely different ideas. Yeah. I agree. I agree with that. As long as it's consensual, and it can go. Sorry. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, I guess it's something we'll uh, we'll see what happens and how these things. Yeah. I mean, it, the group's only been in existence for a few days now, so we're gonna have to wait until it pans out more. Like I said, we've already reached some common grounds, but. That is something that we would need to discuss. And I did actually post something recently about um, their view on authority. You know, I was like, is everybody okay with, um, what did I say, something like abolishing the police state um, and privatizing security or using some sort of measure in which to prevent people from being harmed and to, I guess, punish them? I didn't use that word. <clears throat> but, you know, so we'll see how they respond to that. And uh, because I do feel like that's important. That's not an economics discussion. That's just basic, like, you know, do you all feel like the state needs to be involved at all? I mean, I want to make sure we're all on the same page here, you know? Hmm. So, but yeah. What was the uh, next topic that we had? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about some interesting stuff that happened during the uh, state apocalypse. And New York City, the chief of uh, police extortions there, for example, uh, <laughs> tweeted this post. Stay off the road. We don't want to have to arrest you. It essentially translates to, it's cold as fuck out there, and we don't really want to keep up the pretense, the illusion this weekend, we're here to help you. And, you know, there you go, they're going off in roads, you know, there's their post apocalypse, and they don't really feel like doing they a job and kidnapping piece of people. Yeah. Well, that too, they don't want to have to take people out of centers. Yeah, because they're not consumer driven. Right? Because there's no market competition out there in terms of actually providing your protection for your property and for your life. And so other agencies will go out there and say, hey, um, we're, we're, glad we're here to help you. Like you'll find like AAA will come out there all the time. They don't know where they'll come out there and help you, right? Uh, the police now. <laughs> it's like, or there's also agorism. I mean, like I was saying earlier today when I bought those shovels, that's like, you know, if I had gotten a good shovel, I was only able to find those crappy ones from CVS. But if I had been able to get like one of those ones you can actually like put your foot on, it's got like the steel blade on the end. I totally was gonna walk down the street because all these cars have been plowed and all these cars are like covered with snow. And I was gonna say to people, you know, like I'll dig your car out for like whatever you have to give me. I mean, I wasn't gonna ask for a specific price, just like something for maybe ten bucks. But you know, <laughs> like maybe like that's the art of asking. You know, you can, you can probably get more if you don't say it's specific price. Mm -hmm. You might get nothing one time, but then 50 bucks the next time. But that was my idea, so there's some agorism for you. There we go. <laughs> there's some agorism in there. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was a funny tweet. Uh, the, the ban on travels uh, is over. Uh, local friend uh, Matt Phillips uh, was coming down from New York and said like, everything was closed. Buses weren't going and everything just, just shut down. Uh, it took a long time for an actual fun way to, to get out of there, escape from New York. Um, so this ties in into, I guess, some, something funny, uh, in terms of someone in Brooklyn uh, built an igloo in the blizzard and listed it on Airbnb. Boutique Winter Igloo for Two is a title listed for dripping with ingenuity and alternative lifestyle Aurora Lays, the snowpocalypse of 2016's most desirable getaway. Handcrafted and built using only natural elements, we're offering the <laughs> Uh, and there's great pictures of it. They actually carved out an igloo in there. They have like pillows and a blanket in there you can lie down in, uh, and candles. Uh, looks like one of those awesome cities and photos you see like in hotels putting their kind of igloo structures outside. But doesn't Airbnb offer some sort of um, like insurance or something? I thought there was some sort of uh, like coverage between the person who's running out and the person who's, that's why you pay through Airbnb, right? Uh, yes, that's why you do the service through Airbnb. If you're the person who's hosting, uh, then you're pro provided coverage of insurance through Airbnb okay. in case the um, the people you're hosting trash the place, for example. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that would have been an issue with the with the Well, actually, they, they brought it up <laughs> as an issue. Uh, the company already removed <laughs> has removed it since it was hosted on Airbnb because uh, the living standards for occupancy were not met. 
Uh, what's good to so that Airbnb has uh, their own regulating uh, standards. Indoor plumbing. Or indoor plumbing. Uh, they're saying, <laughs> their response was, they're happy to see that you guys are staying busy and having fun during this apocalypse. Unfortunately, your igloo, while very well constructed, has failed to meet our occupancy standards and has been removed from search results. Be sure to pick a place with running water, electricity, and a roof that doesn't melt. So, we're kind of fun and jovial about it. But I as this goes to so, and when people talk about, like, without government, who regulates, like, businesses do that all the time. They have standards, they have, uh, and placement of their own insurance and practices to resolve conflict disputes. Mm -hmm. Etsy has a lot of this stuff to resolve um, complaints by sellers and by buyers. I mean, eBay has the same right. thing in their standards and what kind of stuff you can sell and what you can't. And Airbnb has their own standards for uh, structural integrity or whatnot. Uh, so that stuff is not something that's you know ordained from the government. Only they can think and create yeah. of something like that. But yeah. Staying in an Airbnb uh, igloo sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> I'll try it out. Alright. <laughs> Christie signs Doherty's right to shovel bill into law. Legislation sponsored by Senator Mike Doherty ensuring that kids have the right to offer snow shoveling services before storms without municipal approval was signed into law by Governor Chris Christie. So okay. these towns wanted kids to register or buy so, uh, expensive Solicitation permits before shoveling, asking to shovel your neighbor's driveway. <laughs> right. You need permission, kid, to use your own shovel. Which is funny because there was that meme going around the internet and it was saying wanted ambitious kids, you know, because like back in the early 90s, like you saw that. Kids were walking down the street, like just trying to make some extra cash, you know, young teenagers shoveling driveways and stuff. And people were like, oh, well, it's because they're inside playing video games. So. Apparently not in some state cities. <laughs> Apparently that's not the case. So we had three offers before noon the day after it's next year. So yeah. there were people yeah. going around. <laughs> Most of them older folks though. Yeah. Not a lot of kids. It might have taken should have taken maybe the offer up, would have saved us an hour, but <laughs> we were armed I did with, it for free. We were armed with the with a broom. A day late. Yeah, the parking space out there. Oh, that. Yeah. No, I, sh I shoveled the um, pathway and the stairs, which were definitely a safety hazard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write you guys up for this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing with uh, mowing lawns and stuff like that. I used to do that uh, as, when I was a teenager, mm -hmm. as a kid. Um, but yeah, it's, it's one of the ways of uh, the cop came up there and approached this guy and said, Hey, what do you think you're doing, kid? You know, so you're making some money. I want, some, uh, I want a cut out of that yeah. as well. Um, it was like the mafia, you know, where's, where's my profit? And uh, they couldn't just uh, ignore it. They couldn't just, uh, just, hey, go ahead and do it. It's your, your shovel. Have fun. Try to be more, you know, business minded, you know, as kids should be kind of growing up in this world. I thought that there, there was like, um, some sort of uh, minimum income that you were legally allowed to make without paying taxes on it. Like, you can make stuff under the table, right? I mean, people get tips, right? Well, they're supposed to claim their tips, but... Right. I uh, mean, isn't there? I thought there was some sort of legislation. Uh, sure. Uh, I think I'm going to make over, like, 11000 uh, It to... may not be federal, so... Yeah, I'm not sure. But yeah, that was... Uh, Created after these two uh, high school kids uh, were out there just doing this, doing their thing, and uh, who was it? Bound for a police extortion. Just told, "Hey, you can't do that. What are you going to go door to door trying to ask people they need help, they need services? You can't do that. We're the one providing services." I would have turned around and been like, "Are you going to do it?" Right. <laughs> you <are> in trouble. <laughs> but the bill only allows them to uh, go out there door to door within 24 hours of a official impending snowstorm. So it's not like a clear cut thing. It's like, hey, go ahead. The law doesn't affect you anymore. It's kind of like up in Maryland. You need, uh, there's a specific date in which you can sell Christmas trees. So if you sell it a day or two before that, you will get fined. You'll get an extortion fine for selling a Christmas tree before there are a lot of time. What's the train of thought behind that? Uh, I don't know. Maybe businesses corral the government to create the law to prevent other people from competing against them until they're ready themselves. Mm -hmm. That's usually the case. Listen, there's no, there's never. Any, I was wondering if it was some sort of environmental. No, thing. there's no rationale behind any, any, any of these government. Uh, Not usually. Prison rules. Yeah. Cool. So next one in regards to what, travel. Where 
Yeah. Uh, well, since we were talking about um, snow and difficulty getting around, obviously, there was an article that came out today, actually, um, and it's Uber and Lyft users are bolt against new laws in a political surge. So this article takes place in Austin, Texas. And it reads as follows. America's first ever ride-sharing based political revolt has started in Texas. And so far, it's been a little short of a route. Late on a Thursday night just before Christmas, the city council in the author's hometown of Austin, Texas, citing questionable public safety concerns, uncorked a surprising ordinance that would require Uber and Lyft drivers to pass mandatory fingerprint-based background checks. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but Uber already does background checks, right? I was actually recently denied a job with Uber because I had uh, I was charged <laughs> and convicted for marijuana possession. Mm. No driving for Uber. I had no container charge for Lyft except for being there just on the area. Mm. So apparently we is worse than open container. Yes. Many ways <laughs> this experience uh, ruined people's lives in terms of uh, finding I guess you know, um, solution down. Yeah, I guess the question that I'm trying to get at here is this is a fingerprint-based background check. So they already, the company already has mandatory background checks when you apply. Mm -hmm. So now they're just trying to dig deeper into the cracks, you know, just to make it more difficult. I mean, it seems... And uh, the thing is, like, you don't see anything in the article, or I haven't heard anything, really, of people being attacked by their Uber drivers. Like, this is completely unprecedented as far as I know. Right, I think I've seen a lot. I've seen of cops attack Uber drivers. Right, <laughs> I've seen I've that seen cops attack a lot of people. Right, so, you really need your fingerprint on record if you have avoided the system thus far. Right. That's no, true. I'm pretty sure. Like, I think I remember being fi fingerprinted in public school. Yeah, I remember too. <laughs> earlier. Early They're like, it's fun. Right? You get to dip your <laughs> finger in ink. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might have done that. In I think, school, yeah, right? no, yeah. it was like an elementary school or something. It was like you were really young and you were like, you just got in a line and you were like fingerprinted. They're like, hey, come on. <laughs> and I was like, yay, I'm finger painting. <laughs> Thank so you. Got it. They do that. <laughs> if I have kids and they do that to them, first of all, they're going to be homeschooled. But let's say that I can't do homeschooling in their public school, I'm going to be like, <laughs> fake sick. <laughs> <Smart. laughs> like, I'm really <laughs> right. Be like, we're gonna we're gonna put a fake one with, like in Gattaca, where they have like the fake fingerprint. <laughs> <laughs> if I remember correctly, I think my mom signed off on that. It's very safe to get fingerprinted. Mm -hmm. Permission to be fingerprinted. Oh, I don't know. Is it? I guess mine did too. Well, both my yeah. parents are cops. So yeah, I don't see a lot of. Uh... They're probably gonna watch this eventually. I should say. <laughs> I don't, I don't see They're delightful people. A lot of businesses requiring fingerprinting checks as well, right? And there's a regular background check in them. Yeah, yeah I've never been. Well, well I, I mean, this is maybe you were doing a government job. I don't know. I mean, I worked for ABC and they didn't even drug test, so. All right. <laughs> just a determinants to people who would otherwise not want to be fingerprinted. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's just basically what it is, is, um, you know, like I said, they're citing the public safety concerns as their reasoning. But most likely, you've already heard cab drivers being upset about Uber and Lyft taking their business. But, I mean, obviously, because Uber and Lyft is all over the place, you know, it's not one centralized area. Um, I mean, sometimes cab drivers are driving around, but have you ever tried to hail a cab in, like, New York? It's been a few years. It's been a few years for me since I've been in New York, but, yeah, it's, it's not always that easy when it's, when it's busy. I mean, half the time, they either don't see you, or they don't care, or they see you and they turn the light off. <laughs> I had, you know, I had a lot of um, when I was in New York City trying to catch a hundred around the spoken word show at the Zimmerman Theater. Uh, yeah, the cats were busy, but then their people were off the clock, uh, who were just coming. Hey, you need a lift? Uh, just turn on the meter, just hop on in. So yeah. you had a lot of, I guess, pre four Uber, <laughs> black market Uber drivers, I guess. Yeah, but apparently there's been a lot of. Um, residents in Austin, Texas, complaining about the cab driver services and saying that the chances of them coming out to get them, uh, like if they live kind of a little bit off the beaten path, like is very rare. And even if they do, it takes several hours. Whereas Lyft or Uber, you know, it tells you when you get on the app that they're five minutes away, you know, something like that. So, mm -hmm. hey, why not? Um, but anyway, so I'm pretty sure this just a facade 
um, that's put in place to limit competition against cab drivers. That's what it looks like. Uh, exactly. They're trying to protect their monopoly, their cartel, they don't like this competition, you know, it means that they kind of have to adapt or die. And I uh, imagine maybe there was such a thing for like uh, video rentals and those like blockbusters thing, trying to, oh, you don't know whether these uh, cassettes from Redbox are legit or not. You know, it's like, you know, you're going to need a license, you're going to need fingerprint ID as to whether to withdraw it from there. You don't know they're, you know, pirated or whatnot. You can't really trust this box sitting out there in the middle of nowhere. Um, but yeah, similar, similar ways. It looks like another way of uh, taxi cab uh, cartels battling the fares of uh, the market to provide. Good stuff for what the consumer's been demanding for a long time. <laughs> Good service, long time. Clean cars. You think if they were really concerned about public safety, this might be implemented for public school bus drivers first? Before right. they go after the <laughs> and companies? Right. Well, it, you know, Uber's made a lot of noise, making a lot of money. Looks right. like they didn't get started on public school buses. Those things are dust traps anyway. Yeah, seatbelts, you need them, except for buses full of kids. <laughs> <laughs> Not for those guys. Um, but anyway, there was a, a recently formed nonprofit group called Ride Sharing Works for Austin, and they have developed an alliance with Uber, Lyft, uh, musicians, and bar owners, obviously, because they want people to be able to get the bar and back home safely, because then you can return as a customer instead of dying in a drunk accident. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, this group was able to collect 65,000 signatures within the span of only three weeks. And they are submitting those to Austin City Council, um, demanding that the council overturn, overturn the ordinance. Now, this gives the council two options, apparently, according to the law that exists there, whichever it's city, state. Um, so once the signatures are confirmed, which most of them probably are legit, I mean 65,000 regardless, uh, the mayor and the council have exactly 10 days to roll back the ordinance. If they don't, there will be a special election held in May, which will force the city to choose between Uber, Lyft, or, according to many residents of Austin, notoriously incompetent cabbies. Hmm. Uh, the election itself will cost the city almost $1 million. Wow. So it's probably in their best interest to go ahead and overturn that ordinance instead of pay $1 million, although... In fact, is those are extortion fees, which they're getting that money from. Um, but I mean, honestly, they're probably kind of low on those resources, since due to Lyft and Uber, or I would say thanks to Lyft and Uber, there's been a drastic decline in DUIs. So that probably has been cutting back on their income there a little bit. Cops in particular like this much, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. So, self driving car is something that cops are not going to enjoy as well. It's like, who do you pull over now? I'm like, great, this is difficult. And how do I you know, validate my existence? Uh, yeah, that's, that's going to be interesting uh, to see how that uh, continues and takes place. I guess uh, we'll follow the story on that one. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, this has been your news from Underground. If you have any uh, topic or stories you'd like for us to cover, uh, put them in the comments section below. This is Cal Molle. Isaac Markison. The last Raptoria, aka Fayin Verger. See you guys at the Victory Party. Take good care. Dollar size rule, but what about the pool who falls victim to the material world?